Raise your hand if you're married. None of you are married. Raise your hand if you would like to be married to your baby's father. One. <laughs> the rest of you who don't plan to get married, why don't you plan to get married? I'd like to know that. You, you already have your child to think about and then a, a whole family to care, to care for. You know, it's, it's a lot of responsibility. And then you don't want the commitments. I don't want no man holding me down because I, I think I can make it as a single parent. But don't you think you might need help in raising that baby from a man? Not really. I didn't have a father. My father wasn't in the home, so, you know, it, it really... Male figures are not substantially important in the family. Thinking about holding up father, no sex, my man. You know, if a girl, you know, she get having a baby, kind of baby, hey, that's on her. You know, I'm not gonna stop my pleasures because of another woman. What about birth control? What about uh, condom? I girls don't like them things. They don't like them things. You know, I'll tell you to take them things off. They figure that you saying that they filthy or they dirty or something. It's been a startling change in values. 25 years ago, you would not have heard such things said so freely because they were not embraced so widely. The strong family was still the backbone of black America, and three out of four children had both parents at home. That is true no longer. Most black children are now growing up without their fathers. The result is a world turned upside down as children copy what they see and repeat what they learn. LaDawn said she didn't have a father in her home and doesn't think her children need one. She's not unusual. Half the black families today are headed only by a woman. Clorinda said she could make it on her own as a single parent. She has never been married and is raising her daughter without a man's help. She's not unusual. Today, nearly 60% of all black children are born out of wedlock. Timothy said his children are not his responsibility. He has left them to be supported by their mothers and welfare. He's not unusual either. For LaDon and Clorinda and Timothy, and many more like them in cities all over America, the traditional family no longer exists. It has vanished, and something new is taking its place. Single women and the children they're rearing alone are the fastest growing part of the black population. What becomes of the black family in a world where the values are being turned upside down? If the parent is 17 and 18, uneducated, unmotivated, fooling around, wandering around, what's the child going to learn? Who's to teach him? When you learn something, you was taught by your parents. It was reinforced by school and your neighbors, but it was taught by your parents. Well, if the parents don't know anything, how are they going to teach the children? So it's not racism that I'm fighting right now. It's the lack of motivation. It's, you see, I'm not even talking about racism. Maybe later on we'll get back to that. But I think uh, we are destroying ourselves. <laughs> portion of CBS Reports is sponsored by Sun Company. At Sun, we believe putting our energy back into the community is just as important as getting it out. Where there's sun, there's energy. From all over the world, crude oil comes to this Sun Company refinery where we make Sunoco products. Since Sun produces nearly 10 million gallons of gasoline a day, one of the most important jobs we have is safety, and not just at work. Many of us use our safety training as volunteer firemen in our community. All right, you guys, let's go. At Sun, we think putting our energy back into the community is just as important as getting it out. When the sun, there's energy. Even when you got a miserable cold, you got to answer the alarms. People depend on us. So when our department was asked to try out this Ulcer Plus cold medicine at home, we said, great, we'll give it a try. See this nose? Dried it right out. Big job. I was feeling really achy, but Elka Seltzer Plus kept me going. You know that stuffy head? Cleared it right up. Good stuff. 
That's why every firefighter who tried it switched to Alka-Seltzer Plus cold medicine. Past effective relief for tough winter colds. Wintry wind. Freezing rain. Outdoor cold. Indoor heat. Winter hands become dry as a dead leaf. But Vaseline Intensive Care Lotion has healing strength that helps give new life to dry hands. Healing strength you can trust to soothe and smooth away roughness, redness, even chapping. With Vaseline Intensive Care, my hands look and feel like new. Vaseline Intensive Care. Healing strength that helps give new life to dry hands. Grandpa, spaghetti's ready. Ready? These vegetables didn't come from my garden. Mmm. Which garden is the sauce from? It's for ragu. Ragu, chunky garden style. Some people think swabs are all the same, but you know Q-tip swabs are soft and safe, with 50% more cotton at the tip. Q-tip's brand cotton swab, because a swab by any other name is not the same. This is Newark, New Jersey, one of America's inner cities. Inner city is a polite name for ghetto, as in black ghetto. Those of us who don't live in the ghetto are brought here usually by television and usually only when there are violent pictures to show. But we have to come here if you want to understand those fearsome statistics about the vanishing black family. Now, a lot of white families are in trouble, too. Single-parent families are twice as common in America today as they were 20 years ago. But for the majority of white children, family still means a mother and a father. This is not true for most black children. For them, things are getting worse. Today, black teenagers have the highest pregnancy rate in the industrial world. And in the black inner city, practically no teenage mother gets married. That's no racist comment. What's happening goes far beyond race. Why then do so many teenage girls get pregnant and have children? Why do so many fathers abandon their families? The answers begin with the people here. They told us what happens to family when mothers are children, fathers don't count, and the street is the strongest school. It is the beginning of another school day in Newark, New Jersey. Another day of class for Clarinda Henderson. She is 17 and had hoped to graduate from high school next year, but that was before the birth of her baby. <laughs> I dream that having a little baby, you could just cut in your arm, just hug all the time, kiss on it, and smell it, because it's uh, so sweet. I thought it'd be fun until I had it. The reality's the different. reality just punched me right in the eye. I, like, had to pinch myself and see if I was here, because I was like, this is too much. Clorinda was only 15 when she got pregnant with her daughter, Shaquana. She is not unusual. Half of all black teenagers become pregnant. Clorinda has never been married. She's still living with her mother at home, where she's raising her baby daughter. Clorinda goes to a special school for dropouts after she takes her daughter to a daycare center. She has fifth grade math skills and reads at a sixth grade level. When I got pregnant, I said, well, I had, I'm going to have this baby, and she's not going to stand in the way of my education. I'm not going to let no one stand in the way of my education. I ain't going to be like these other girls, just drop out, can't get no job, no money, have to be on welfare. He's ready. On the vocabulary. Bingo. Clarinda learned about birth control in sex education courses, but she still became pregnant. You think it was a mistake? Well, I'll say no, because I wasn't on any, you know, birth control methods, neither was he, and, you know, we were sexually active, and when it happened, it just happened. When you think back to that day when you learned you were pregnant, what went through your mind? Oh, gosh, I'm going to tell my mother, and I'm going to tell my mother, she going to make me get abortion. I was really scared, I think. Why didn't you want to get an abortion? Because I wanted his baby. What did you like about him? His legs. His legs? 
Yeah, I, I got a thing for bow-legged boys. Bow-legged boys. I love them. <laughs> they, they have some gorgeous legs. I just don't know. Darren Lyle is the father of Clorinda's baby. He is 18 and lives in central Newark. He dropped out of high school when he was 16. He has never held a steady job. I spend most of my time listening to the radio. I don't go to school. I don't work. I don't do nothing. Just like this, killing time. Did you want to have a baby? Nah, 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 really. It just happened. No, she just popped up pregnant. Nah, it just. Were your friends impressed? Not if you know everybody was telling me, you know, that you know she, you know she looked just like me, and you know she is kind of kind of cute, and, you know, kind of pretty. You know, that is like you know make you know make me feel good. <laughs> sure. Mm -hmm. Do many of them have babies? I seem like that's all my baby doing if I is making babies and so making babies. Darren told us that in this neighborhood it's easy to get involved with girls and easy to get into trouble. Darren has been arrested five times for stealing, suspicion of homicide, and for possession of a deadly weapon. When you were arrested for carrying a dangerous weapon, what was it? One of them big machetes. Machete? Knives and big knives. You mean you just carried around with you? I used to bring it to school with me. I mean, that's uh, just hard to conceal that, isn't it? No, nah, because I had like this blue coat. It was like a blue goose. I poked a hole in the pocket of it, and I used to just put it right in there. Isn't that dangerous? That's the way stuff was going, you know, like... That's the way the people was acting towards me. So I felt like I needed a weapon. Because, you know, it used to seem like, you know, it's like a boy, really, like Vietnam. Have you asked Darren to help you with the baby? No, because I see he can't even help himself. He can. It's pitiful to say that, but he can. He wasn't prepared to be a father? No. And he still isn't. Were you ready to be a mother? <laughs> Well, no. But now that I am, I just have to take it step by step. You should not tend to head it. Clorinda relies on welfare to support Shaquana. <laughs> but it's her mother, Gloria Henderson, who gets the check for the whole family. Gloria, 34, has never been married. She was a teenager when Clorinda was born, just as her own mother, Clorinda's grandmother, had been when Gloria was born. When you were pregnant, did you assume that you could turn to welfare for help after the baby came? Well, yeah, but I didn't have her just to collect welfare. I had her because I felt that it would have been a part of me. I would have had somebody to live for and also somebody to love and love me back. Is your daughter the first person you've ever loved? I really, really love my daughter. Two months after the birth of their baby, Florinda was pregnant again by Darren. This time she had an abortion. She didn't think she could handle two little children while still a teenager herself. Your grandmother was a single woman with a child. Your mother, a single woman with a child. Now you, why is that happening? I really didn't plan on getting pregnant, but if I really had somebody to really sit down and talk to, like really express my feelings to them, I don't think none of this would have happened. And then when it did happen, my grandma's like, I told you this, I told you this, tell me nothing. Nobody told Darren anything either. He too lives at home with his mother. Where's your father? Locked up. Locked up where? Green Street. What for? Fighting and shit. Fighting. Violence. Stuff like that. Had anybody ever told you what it is like to be a father? I like watching other, other older, you know, I had What'd kids. What did you learn from it? How did you put I it learned you? that they take a, like, a lot of patience. Take a lot of patience. You have a lot of patience? I don't got a lot of patience. Clorinda doesn't always have a lot of patience either. You want to fight? No. They don't ask me if I want to fight if you don't want to fight. Don't say to me. 
Yeah, yeah, of course then. You know. Come in now. Talk to you. Like going out like that. No, you went out. You shouldn't have said nothing to me. You don't know already kept piss me off. What I do? <laughs> Two months after her abortion, Clorinda and Darren broke off their relationship. They see each other rarely now. Once in a while, Clorinda will take Shaquana to visit. Do you ever think about marrying Clorinda? Why not? <laughs> Think about that. Nah, that's the last thing on my mind. You ever feel depressed? I don't be feeling, I don't be like sad. I just be like frustrated. I don't be, I'm like really like frustrated. What are the odds that your daughter will follow the same route? Because there was your grandmother, no. your mother, and you. No, I see to that. No. She won't. I would sit down, I would talk to her about her being a young lady like Juana. If we go out here, you have sex, be sure you on birth control, or, you know, if you do have sex, make sure whoever you having sex with care about you. Don't just let them just get, just let, you know, them get over on you thinking they got a piece of the action now they can go tell Tom, Dick, and Harry. Did your mother tell you those things? No. You tell them to yourself? I talk to myself in the mirror. <laughs> But, and you say no, no? No, no. And like I said to my daughter, no, no. <laughs> no more. Now, Selsun Blue, the number one doctor recommended dandruff shampoo, introducing a new extra conditioning formula. It leaves my hair looking so soft and manageable. It has five conditioners, including aloe, that leaves hair in beautiful condition. And Selsun Blue Extra Conditioning Formula contains the anti-dandruff ingredient doctors recommend most. No leading brand gets rid of dandruff flaking or itching better. New Selsun Blue Extra Conditioning Formula controls dandruff and leaves hair in beautiful condition. Mmm, <coughs> smell this fresh-cut cedar. <laughs> Nothing can penetrate this stuffy nose. This can. Hull's vapor action penetrates to help your stuffy nose feel clearer while Hull soothes your cough. For penetrating relief, get Hull's vapor action. A simple fact. This plus this reduce more plaque than this alone. Listerine reduces plaque by up to 50% over brushing alone for better oral hygiene. Listerine. It fights plaque and bad breath. And that's a fact. Breakfast in a tropical paradise. Great idea. <laughs> I call it native brilliance. Brilliance? But you forget the name of your favorite cereal. With all this tropical fruit, it's fruit and... Yeah? Uh... Post fruit and fiber tropical fruit. Tastes so good you forget the fiber. Now 20% more fiber with sunny pineapple, crunchy banana chips, and coconut. So all you remember is... It's fruit and tropical fruit. Lost in paradise. Post fruit and fiber cereal. Tastes so good you forget the fiber. Well, at least one of them's gold. How about some coffee? It's decaffeinated. Half a cup's fine. You drink decaf? Sure. And when I find one that's got a full flavor, I'll have a full cup. This one does. Brim? It's got full, rich flavor. Now this is a fine. Fill it to the rim. With a full, rich taste of brim decaffeinated coffee. Alessandra Jackson is 23. She's the mother of two, expecting a third, and is not married. She, too, lives in Newark. Like nearly half of all black children in America, Alice's children are being raised in poverty. They live a subsidized life in subsidized housing. But that's not what Alice wanted or intended. Alice lives in one of the toughest neighborhoods in Newark, in the project where she was born and brought up. But she hoped that one day, she would move out of here. She graduated from high school, went to business college for a year, and worked steadily until she became pregnant with her first child. You know, I was doing so good before I was pregnant. I had a little job. I kept money, you know, stuff. But after I had the child, that's when money started going low. What was your reaction when you found out you were pregnant the first time? Did you intend to get it pregnant? It wasn't, no, it wasn't planned. 
But when I got pregnant, I wanted to be a mother, be a mother. You know, it was exciting to me. I just thought if I had something of my own, a little child is gonna call me mom. <laughs> You know, after you have them, it's hard. You know, you got to bomb this, you got to bomb that. Malik is Alice's firstborn. He is now three years old. Happy birthday to you! Soon after he was born, Alice, then 20, quit her job to take care of him. Sixteen months later, her second child, Antoine, was born. When we met, she was six months pregnant with her third child. Timothy McSeed is 26, the father of Alice's three children. Though they're not married, they see each other regularly. When I first met him, I didn't like him. But when he started talking to me, it seemed like he was like a man that wanted to have a home, have children, take care of them. Did you talk with Timothy about how you were going to support the baby when you were pregnant? No, that's what we didn't do. No, we didn't even talk about how we was going to support the child. Timothy McSeed held his last steady job two and a half years ago. He's been arrested several times on robbery and drug charges. He was brought up in Newark by his mother, who was 16, when Timothy was born. His father has another family in another city. Timothy has a talent for drawing, which he has never developed. He dropped out of high school at 16 and spent two years in the job corps. He was 23 when he and Alice had their first child. Timothy does not support any of his children. How many children do you have? Six. <laughs> he fathered those six children by four women. He also had two more children by two other women, but one died in infancy and the other was aborted. We asked him about the birth of his first surviving child. It was kind of a funny experience because, like, me and the girl was just messing around, right? And she was going with somebody else. She used to be an old girlfriend of mine. She managed to get popped up by me. Okay, that's the second baby. The third was... Mustafa. Mustafa. He was the third. That was by another lady? Mm -hmm. Mrs. Ward. Yes, I go see him every now and then. How old is he now? He's five, if I'm not mistaken. Five or four, even more. And then the fourth one was? Shimon. I don't, I only saw her twice. Two times. What happened to her? It was a family problem. You know, the father don't want me to see the, the mother and all that. You know, so I got tired of running behind her and uh, found me someone else. I didn't have to sweat it because I guess the father was taking care of them anyway, so. How does it feel to have those women? No, kids. Kids, oh, all right. <laughs> well, you get to see, um, if it ain't one thing you've done, you, <laughs> like artwork, for instance. You look at your art, you say, this is something that I've done. Just like the cop did, it's something that you've done. You can see what you've done. If, if anything, if you don't do nothing, you can see something, you know what your life was, you know, what it was to you. So the kids are sort of artwork? Well, not really, but you can, um, like they might grow up to be doctors or actors, you know, and you can say, look, that's my boy, or that's my girl, you know. Whereas, you know, there's some people that can't have children at all. Their mothers raised Timothy's children, and welfare pays for them. On the first day of each month at noon, the mothers gather outside the project's mailroom, waiting for the postman to deliver their checks. Oh, I call, we call it Mother's Day. Why? Because us mothers be getting our check that day, getting their welfare checks, so we call it Mother's Day. Alice's welfare check comes to $385 a month. She cashes it at the corner store. Back in town now. She gets another $112 in food stamps. I don't think I would have had the second two children if I didn't think welfare was there. I don't like welfare because it makes me lazy. It does? Yeah, it makes you lazy just to sit around and wait for a monthly check to come in. You know, I just like to work. I like money coming every week or every two weeks. 
Why doesn't Timothy help you take care of those kids? Um, one thing I do know about Timothy right. that if he did have a job, I'll see you another blue moon. I know he would take care of me and the children and the bills. But what's holding him back? Well, this is what he tells me all the time. Um, he figure I'm gonna be with another guy. Or I'm gonna slip away from him while he at work. That don't make no sense to me. Don't you get mad sometimes? I get mad a lot of times about financially support from Timothy. What do you say to him? I always say it ain't that hard to get a job. Go out there and look for a job because I'm sick and tired of just laying back waiting for a welfare check. I said, this is not how I want to live the rest of my life. This is not the way I plan for my future to be. Does it make you feel bad that you can't support your kids? Yes. How do they make it? Where do they Where do they get the money? Well, daddy on the mother's on welfare, and welfare gives them the stipend for the month. So what I'm not doing, the, the government does. What would happen if the government didn't? <laughs> it's going to be a big disaster, I guess, because you can't give something that you don't have. In order to give, you got to have for yourself. You see, people out there watching are going to say, why didn't he think about that before he brought six kids into the world? Well, mother had a choice. She could have had abortion, or she could have kept the child. She, just, she decided the way that she wanted to have the child, so... Therefore, I guess it's not sweating her. I mean, it's not bothering You think it's her fault if she gets pregnant? Well, I mean, you fought her. Well, maybe, maybe not. I just say, Mama, baby, Papa, maybe. You know what I mean? A week before their last baby is born, Alice came for what is only her fourth visit to the doctor during her pregnancy. Yeah, I was very much wary, and I was kind of unhappy being pregnant. You know, to know that I'm going to have a third child and I'm not doing so good with my, my two I have already. Is that some? Come with me, please. But as, you know, the months went by, I just Where was the had to deal with it, being pregnant and knowing that it's my child, I'm going to have a child. And, and I'm just going to have to support it the same way I supported them. Okay, let me do better if I can do better. Is that the last one? Well, I ain't going to say that because I said that when I had my first one. So I, then I had a second one. When I said that was my second one, and I had a third one. So I ain't going to say that. Did you think about birth control? No, I didn't even think about birth control. I was afraid of birth control because I always heard that birth control gave you cancer and all that stuff. What about Timothy? Did you talk to him about taking precautions about being yeah, careful? Yeah, I talked to him about being careful about you know, birth control. But? Mm -hmm. but? But? Did he? No, he wasn't with it. <laughs> On Father's Day, Alice and Timothy had their third son, Hakeem Lamont Jackson, seven pounds, seven ounces. Yay, little boy. Little boy. I'm the king. I'm the king. Hey. How you feeling now? You feeling all right, sweetheart? No, I'm still So many women, so many children. Do you ever think that maybe you shouldn't do it? 
Mm-hmm. Unless, yeah, unless unless you can be sure you don't have a kid. Oh, not really, because I'm highly sexed. But I have uh, ways of cooling myself down. You know, because like when you're dealing with one female and you're not dealing with another female, having sex with her too much is bad. So you have to like, you know, set a schedule when you should do it and when you should not. You seem to break your schedule sometimes. Well, like most women say, you're a baby maker. I just got strong sperm. <laughs> Would you have had these kids if you'd thought about them in advance? No. All were an accident. Yeah, you could say that. Were you just having a good time? <laughs> yeah, a lovely time. I enjoyed myself. And you didn't think about marrying any of these women except the first one, the first girl? Yes. Well, I'm going to marry Alice. Sandra. Oh, yes. We're going to get married. Do you love Sandra? Yes. A lot. Great deal. Does she love you? Go crazy about me. Tell me, why don't you get married? Well, see, I'm old-fashioned. I want a big wedding. That's that. And uh, my uncles and my aunts, you know, they all had their little tuxedos, and I'm going to have mine, too. I thought you were going to say to me, because I can't afford to at the moment. Oh, that ain't it. Because I'm going to find me something. I'm going to get something. See, I'm strong in that spot. When? I'm find something. Never. I keep on trying. I don't never give up. You know, you feel very responsible for your children, and Timothy doesn't. What does that say? Mm-hmm. Sometimes I think like that. I said, Dad, here I am. I got two children, one on the way. Well, this was before the first one. I'm doing this all by myself. And sometimes, you know, if you sit down and think about that, I know I really get very upset because I don't think he really understand that I'm here, you know, taking care of all this by myself. If he get that, if he think like that, I think he'll do something. I don't really think he understand that I'm doing that. Why do you let him off the hook? Why do you put up with it? And sometimes I'll be like telling him, leave me alone, it's so with. But every time I do that, when he's not with me, even that same day or the next day, I feel, you know, lonely without him. feel like, you know, I just get angry and say them things. I don't really be meaning them. So. Do you love him? Yes, I love him. Does he love you? Yes, I think he loves me, too. <laughs> They call this cattle country. It's also where a lot of America's coal is. So when Sun Company built a Cadero mine here, folks worried about the future of the land. But Sun also developed this land reclamation center to make sure the land is properly restored. At Sun, we think putting our energy back into the land is just as important as getting it out. Where there's sun, there's energy. I love losing weight. But I hate counting calories. With a full-time job and taking classes, who's got time to count calories? But SlimFast helped make losing weight easier because it counts the calories and you lose the weight. Each delicious shake is a complete weight loss meal with vitamins, minerals, protein, fiber, and bran. What an easy diet plan. SlimFast counted the calories and I lost the weight. SlimFast helps make losing weight easier. It counts the calories, you lose the weight. Vitamin E. Now it's been captured in soft sense, and suddenly you feel so soft. No soft sense. Absorbs fast, conditions naturally, until skin is so soft it must be touched. Feels so healthy, feels so smooth, it will be touched. Now with vitamin E, new soft sense, and suddenly everything is softer. Mom and Dad bought this table the year I was born. Look at it. Beautiful. And all Mom did was dust every week with Pledge. And now Endus says watch out for buildup after 28 years. Come on. Pledge is self-cleaning for a fresh shine every time you dust. 
Compare that to Endes, which just evaporates, leaving wood looking dry and defenseless. A pledge shine protects and cares for wood. Pledge, a fresh shine every time. For 28 years and counting. The 76ers and the Celtics. The rivalry continues tomorrow on CBS Sports. Sunday. How are you going to watch the Super Bowl and not miss any of 60 Minutes? Easy. For that night only, 60 Minutes moves to 9, 8 Central on CBS. Followed by Murder, she wrote. He happens to be innocent. Pat Harrington and Morgan Brittany guest star. All Super Bowl Sunday at special times. Tomorrow on CBS. E451 is not much to pay for a brand new Buick. That's the sticker price of our new Buick Skyhawk. It includes power steering, power brakes, tinted glass, AM FM stereo, rear window defogger, and more. Plus, one other nice feature a new Buick Sport Shift that gives the term fun to drive a whole new meaning. If you've never thought about Buick like this before, the time is now. At Sims, you'll never see this word, because Sims represents at off price over 200 world-famous designer and brand names in men's, women's, and children's clothing. There's never a reason for a sale. You can always buy men's current, nationally advertised $235 suits for $139, women's $140 designer outfits for $79. At Sims, an educated consumer is our best customer. Meet the new mob, Wednesday. There's a famous book about the black experience in America called The Invisible Man. Ironically, the young black man today is anything but invisible. He's the one who shows up in the highest unemployment rate. He's right there at the top of the crime statistics. He's the one most threatening to his black neighbors and the one most feared in the mind of white America. Every teenage boy growing up can go either way, but the son of a single young woman in the ghetto is pressured to go the wrong way every time he steps onto these streets. What do you see for your future out there? You're how old now? I'm 15, and right now, if I keep going like it's going now, I really think I probably would make it, and then again, I probably wouldn't have all the things that I really want in life right now, but I think I would have most of the things I want. For teenagers like Bernard Wardrick and his friends, Bosky, C., and Mike, there are no familiar roadmaps for the way up and out. It is the street and the media that teach a boy here how to become a man. Bernard dreams of making it as a rap star. He and his friends have formed a group, The Educated Three. I like that. So here they come. Look, New Jersey, your own educated three. I'm the educated B. The educated C. Two fresh MCs. Most definitely B. Two fresh MCs. We can't stop. We're going to rock the mic till we hit the top. What you heard before, we're going to hear it again. The educated two came here to win. Oh, we did something. That wasn't for life. We almost forgot. DJ Money Mike. So why the people out there in the place of the people? What is rapping? To me, it's like poetry because, you know, I could just sit down and write it. I could sit at the table or whatever, or whatever, wherever I'm at, and I, and I can just think of it. What does it take to be a good rapper? What's the skill? You gotta have style, class, and originality. <laughs> Anybody can rhyme. You just gotta put yourself into it and make it mean something. The educated three tell the story of the only life they know, the life of their block. They were born and raised here in homes without fathers, and most of their time is spent here. The world they describe is no nursery rhyme, as Bernard's friend C told us. All the people got guns that turn stick up kids while their mother is at home, shedding tears because the son that she thought she had brought up right is on the streets leading a terrible life. He's walking down a road heading for nowhere. From my point of view, he don't even 
love and care Because the attitude he has makes him care about nothing Not his mother, his brother, or even his cousins He think life is all about on the streets Being a two-time loser and a petty thief But everybody know that you're a thief of the week Because you're no good for nothing This way you're good for something Oh boy, the only thing you're good for is fronting You wrote this? Yeah Who'd you write about? I judged a lot on myself Because I used to be out there, man out there on the street? Yeah, just 18 years, I've seen a lot happen that I never thought I'd see. When you're out on that street, is it dangerous? It's dangerous, but yeah. it's dangerous. Any day you can go outside, anything can happen yeah, to you. Yeah, but it's how you make it, too. Yeah, yeah. Right. Can a guy get killed on the street easily? Sure. <laughs> see how you blink your eye? Pops, like that. Yeah. Kill just like that. The leading cause of death for young black men is murder. One in 21 will be killed before the age of 25. Bernard was shot and robbed by two teenagers when he was 15. Four months later, he was arrested for carrying a gun. That is not unusual. Nearly half of young men in the inner city are arrested before they reach 18. Trouble, Bernard told us, waits at every corner. How does a guy keep from falling into that trap that you described in that rap? If you see everybody else robbing man and selling drugs, you suppose to, it takes a wise man to learn from another man's mistakes. The adults got a set example for the kids. If they see the adults do it, you know, that's what they're going to do too, eventually. Who would be an, an example? My, my family, my mother. His mom is Brenda Wardrick, 30 years old, the mother of four children by three different men. She has never been married. She raises her children alone in a daily tug of war with the street. It's a battle. It's almost like, um, and I think most parents feel the same way you fear for your children leaving home. They can leave out and walk right across the street and trouble can get in their way. What's the hardest thing about being a single parent? It's hard. You know, understanding them sometimes, and they have difficulties understanding me because I'm a young parent, and sometimes they act like I'm their sister as well as their mother, you know. Brenda was just 14 when she became pregnant with Bernard, her first child. Bernard's father was 15. By the time she was in her early 20s, there were three more children, each unplanned. To support them, Brenda works on and off as a nurse's aide, but she could not make ends meet without welfare. None of the children's fathers give her any financial support. I don't understand what happens that causes so many fathers not to take responsibility for the kids they created or helped to create. It's easier on their pockets if they can. But most of the men today don't, you know, assume their responsibilities as they should. Not that they can't. They just don't. Well, I'd get very mad if I were a mother. I think I would. Oh, I get angry. But getting angry isn't going to solve anything. And then sometimes, you know, their fathers... They feel like if they're going to support them, then they have to have more time with me. And I don't feel that that's really necessary, you know. You'd rather take the burden of the children alone than to have to... I wouldn't rather, but I have. What do your children mean to you? My friends. They're my world, you know. When I wake up in the morning... See, you know, if you don't have a husband or um, a man with you... Your children are always there, so you have someone to call your own. So your children will smile when nobody else will. Do you want your kids to get married? Sure. Especially my daughter. My boys, they'll probably be, uh, what you call it, uh, freelancers. Freelancers? <laughs> yeah. Like their fathers? Yeah. Maybe. I don't know. That does seem to be the pattern. Yeah. I come along. Once a single mother like Brenda would not have been so alone in raising children. She was born here in rural North Carolina, surrounded by an extended Baptist family. But her father went north looking for work, and Brenda was raised in Newark. Many summers, she came back south to visit her kinfolk. They still live here and every year hold a family reunion. With her present boyfriend, Lamont Banks, Brenda brought her children down for the occasion. Jesus 
She wanted Bernard especially to see a world different from the streets of Newark. reunion let us pray almighty all wise and eternal god the church was part of the extended family it was sanctuary community comfort brothers and sisters in faith and consolation oh what a fellowship what a peace in my when you're away from people that you love and care about these reunions sort of just makes up for the distance, you know. You spend a little time and you go back and you look forward to the next time. Keeps us together, keeps me going. I'm lighting this for my great grandfather and my great And I'm hoping that my children will get together and get reunions to keep the flow, be close with their family. More than blood, place, and faith held these families together through hard times, there was memory never more alive than at the old family burial ground. Brenda's three aunts brought her and the kids to see where their roots run, far from the main highway, farther still from Newark. But it was Did you have nice. to work, work in those days in the field? Sure, we worked in the field, but not, they got so much equipment now. People don't have to work hard now. What was the hardest? Picking, Picking cotton. cotton. <laughs> Picking cotton, that was the hardest. You all really have uh, strong ties here, don't you, to this piece of earth? Oh, of course, sure. Is this cemetery all Wardricks? As far as I know, this is the it's old a Wardrick family. family. Now that would be Bernard's great, great grandfather. Right. What kind of man was he? Wonderful. 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 Brenda, do you try to tell your kids about the family? Yes, I do. As, as much as I possibly can. And whenever I come home, I always ask questions. It's a lot that I don't know. Mm. And I'm still learning a lot about them. But there's a lot you want to know? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And I want my children to know. Why? Because I think they should know who they are and where they come from and what we all stand for. I, don't, I just get a good feeling when I'm here, you know, and I want to share that with my kids. Together we stand. Right, we must fall. Together we stand. Yes, sir. You think that's true as a family? Yes, sir. Yes. It's hard to hold a family together, though, isn't it? Oh, true. Oh, that's true. I think it's harder today than it was when you were little? It seems to be. I can remember years ago when, if something happened over here, our family in Virginia was right here. Everybody and pitch in. Right. Mm -hmm. And now, you never hear of that. But it's up to us to try and keep it together. But this is what we were taught. Love and affection, that's the only way we can make it. Bernard, this is such a change from Newark. What do you think when you're here in this, in this place? Um, I enjoy coming to visit, but, you know, I don't really, I wouldn't like to live here. Cause Why? The environment isn't the same. You got about 20 to 30 houses on one block. <laughs> and down here, you know, you got like a half a mile. <laughs> Before you a lot more up. action up there, right? Yeah. yeah. I enjoy it when I come down here. I love to visit. But I wouldn't like to live down here. What do you think your life would be without if you, if you didn't have these folks here and didn't come to these reunions? Empty. Maybe almost not belonging somewhere. I just couldn't imagine not having this here, you know. Of course, you have these reunions and this place and these people to fall back on. What do you think your children will have to fall back on? This is what I'm trying to share with them so that they will have this too. But it's this, not Newark, isn't it? No. They won't. They're, they're missing a lot. Because this is where I was born and they were born in Newark. I don't think they have, they're not as fortunate. But Bernard calls this home and doesn't miss the extended family that means so much to his mother. His notion of extended family means something different. The rap group, friends from the street, and Brenda's boyfriend, Lamont Banks. Lamont is 31 years old, and much of what has happened over the last generation to the young black man who grew up in a broken family in the inner city is reflected in his experience. 
Lamont was raised in Newark by a single mother and grew up on the street. Now he has two children of his own who live with their mother in another part of town. He works when he can cleaning oil drums, but does not support his children or Brenda's. He has become one of Bernard's acting role models. He told us what it was like to spend his teenage years, as Bernard is doing, in the school of the street. I grew up hard. hard. I, I grew up um, basically being the man of my family at 13. Mommy was there, but mommy was like um, always saying, well, she needed this or it was hard and you know sometimes we'd go in the house and didn't have no food you know what i mean and i couldn't take that sometimes you know so i would take to the streets and and uh whatever was necessary so i could bring my mother some type of relief or help steal if it took Hustle. if it took that how did you as a kid get caught up in that street life hanging with a crowd what happened give me some examples i was Basically, I was I was going with this girl, and um, at 12 years old, and uh, these other guys liked her, and they jumped me, and I got me a bat, and I put me some nails in this bat, and I taped this bat up with these nails in it, and I went looking for these guys, and each one I caught, I hit them with this bat. And I hurt them with this bat, you know? What happened? Um, their parents came to my mother with the police and they um, locked me up. Several years later, I um, shot a guy out of anger. Anger? Anger. What he had done to me had maybe hurt my feelings, but not so much to the point where I should have did what I'd done. What did he do? You know, he spit on me. And you shot him? And I shot him. Not that I probably couldn't beat him, but I was just that angry to the point where I wanted to kill somebody. And you had the gun on you? Yeah, a rifle, not a gun, a rifle. Was it normal to carry a gun when you were growing up? Yeah, to protect yourself. What does a kid need to know to be smart on the street, to be a big man? To be hateful, be mean. Don't care about the next person. If you get in my way, I don't go around you. I go over you. A doctor told me yesterday that one out of every 15 kids on the streets of Newark could be dead by the end of this year. There's so much violence. It's, 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 it's a lot. How are you going to keep Bernard from being one of those? Well, basically with Bernard, you give him a, you give him a straight rule, and hopefully he follows it. You know, he ain't no special child or nothing like that. But if you tell Bernard something, Bernard will listen, and Bernard will do it. Is there a tug of war between the street and what you imagine yourself becoming one day? Yes, because I really be hoping to get up out of this. And and there's be times I'll be wondering, well, how I'm going to do it and if I'll be able to do it. But I really think I'll be able to because That's, I'm strong. The street's strong too, though, isn't it? Yes, it is. It really is because it's a lot of our things that's out there that be, you know, pull you back. But you stand to the right things and do the right thing, you, you can make it. I actually get the sense talking to Bernard that he's still a little boy struggling to be a man and he's more boy than man. Yes. Yes. Do you think he has a chance to get out of here to a good environment? Fresh I start? I hope so. I hope so. And that's all I can say is to hope. Does your heart sometimes beat twice when you see him walk down those steps and out into that? Every day. Every day. I wonder if he'll make it reach his destination safely and then return back home. My relief is when I hear his key turn in the door in the afternoon and I know at least it's back home. That chili you had for dinner has just started a three alarm fire inside you. Alka Seltzer to the rescue. 
Alka-Seltzer goes to work instantly to take the burn out of your heartburn and also quiet the sirens in your head. So when your body is sending you smoke signals, send Alka-Seltzer to the rescue and put out the fire fast. Alka-Seltzer to the rescue. Ten hours, no power. The longer dishes sit. Ten hours. The harder they are to clean. That's when you need lemon scent sunlight detergent. Beautiful. Lemon sunlight really stands up to dishes that sit. Ring around the collar. Can you believe it? A girl would tell her boyfriend he's got ring around the collar. What? Me? Tough stains need whisk. Whisk gets ring around the collar and your whole wash clean. No more ring around the collar. <laughs> no more TV. Monday. The night pirates are here. An elderly spy holds a deadly secret. But will he crack under pressure on Scarecrow and Mrs. King? Then Kate and Allie bring back the 60s. I never went to a city before in a tight skirt and heels. But the times, they are a-changing. Most kids' mothers are serving meatloaf and we're serving time. And Newhart suffers a measles epidemic with Stephanie as a nurse. <laughs> oh, I don't even like being on the same planet with mucus. Then Keckney and Lacey go after a mugger who preys on the helpless. Monday. Good evening from CBS News. This is Newsbreak. Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi boarded a patrol boat and traveled to what he called the line of death that he claims is the beginning of Libyan waters. He warned U.S. forces in the area not to cross it. In South Africa, mourners at a tribal funeral attacked and killed a man thought to be a government informer. Others stoned homes and cars and there were 41 arrests. Judith, could you send $350 to Santa Fe right away? To send money fast, come to Western Union. It'll get to any of our 9,000 locations usually in 15 minutes or less. Western Union, the fastest way to send money. The University of Minnesota basketball coach has resigned following the arrest of three of his players who were accused of rape. The spacecraft Voyager 2 has sent back pictures of the planet Uranus revealing a previously unknown 10th ring around it and a 15th moon. I'm Marlene Sanders, CBS News, New York. More news later on this CBS station. This is CBS. I still can't believe my family's moving back to the States. You know, they say that if you kiss in front of this fountain, you always come back. Saying goodbye is never easy, but saying hello is. With AT&T, 10 minutes to Italy can average just 71 cents a minute. Only AT&T keeps you this close anywhere in the world. AT&T International, long distance service. Good morning, Alan Combs, WABC Talk Radio 77. Coming up, Combs on the corner, and the question, where is your tibia located? Alan Combs talks funny. Swan Lake? Ever wonder how much Dave Winfield gets per hit? We'll talk about it. Let's go to the phones for the Combs quiz. Alan Combs talks sports. I want to use this. Investment problems? Bill Bresnan, along with his wife Ginny May and his dog CD who rolls over, explains it all in money news you can use. How about this button? Alan B. Combs talks to you. Mornings on WABC Talk Radio 77 AM. John Madden Super Bowl special tonight. You won't find in these neighborhoods the primetime family of Bill Cosby. There are successful, strong black families in America, families that affirm parental authority and the values of discipline, work, and achievement. But not many live around here. Still, not every girl in the inner city ends up a teenage mother. Not every young man goes into crime. There are people who have stayed here to fight for these kids. They're outnumbered by the con artists and pushers. It's not an even match, but they stand for morality and authority and give some of these kids a bracing dose of unsentimental love. When their own fathers are missing, kids need someone else to stand in to practice damage control as the street take over. For these kids, that someone is Detective Shahid Jackson of the Newark Police. He came by his street smarts the hard way. Well, I came up out of the streets, so I know how to get around a lot of that stuff. And I guess the older you get, the more you learn. I was fortunate enough coming up that I never got caught. <laughs> and I grew out of the streets, but yet I still have some of the street in me. There was a time when he wasn't sure he would make it off those streets. He was an unmarried father at 18, and he had his share of troubles. But he was raised by two parents. His father was a Baptist minister, and they pushed him to make something of himself. 
on Sunday morning on my block, you would see each family almost coming out going to church. You know, you don't see that anymore. The family unity. When he was 21, Shahid Jackson joined the police department. Although he handled security for us while we were in Newark, his beat is the kids of the neighborhood who look up to him as if he were their father. What he can do with them here, he knows, is just warm up for what they face out of the ring and out of his reach. Going for the title. Work, 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 work. Title! What have you learned about these kids? That they need somebody to love them. You know, they identify with us because we don't, excuse the expression, we don't take any crap. You know, you come in here, you got to be disciplined, you got to, you know, follow the rules and regulations. Because when they go out here and deal with life, they're going to have to follow rules and regulations in life. Self-control and self-esteem, far more important than a good left hook. That's his message to kids like Bernard Wardwick. He's been coaching Bernard for the past four years. It's like a big brother father image with me and Bernard. There's been times when he's gotten me mad and I've spanked him, you know, and uh, his mother knows I'll spank him and he knows I'll spank him. And sometimes that's what a kid needs to know. Freedom is a lot of times destruction. The more freedom a man has, a lot of times he'll just self-destruct. So I try to, you know, keep him in a little cage. Somebody. Keep him in my arms. Somebody has to say no. Yeah, somebody has to say no, you cannot do this. A lot of these kids grew up with nobody saying no. Right. Do you think it's important for them to have men around? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, if you have a one-parent family and it's a mother, she cannot teach you all of the things that a man can teach a son. There's no way. So where do they learn the routine techniques of just daily work and living? They don't. Unless they get it from their parents, they'll get it from the streets. How do these kids on the streets make it? He could either be a stick-up man if he stays uh, in the streets. He could be a mugger. He could be a, a drug dealer. There's so many different things. Like, you get a kid who's a good boxer, and uh, a drug dealer may say, hey, you want to make so much money a day? Just make sure nobody stick up my man here. He becomes a, a soldier for the drug dealer. Or a strong the, arm, you know. Helping to protect the drug helping dealer. Helping to protect him. Because if he can make $100 a day or $60 a day just standing there watching something, and, you know, he does it. That's the battle that you got to deal with, you know, that's the war, to try to convince them that that stuff isn't uh, in the streets, isn't what's uh, in their best interest. Does it worry you that Bernard could fall into that? I think he could go either way, but I think I, if he does, it'll be uh, something that'll really hurt me, so I don't think I'll let him go. <laughs> you know, he's like a son to me. What do you think's ahead for kids like Timothy and Alessandra? It's going to be rough. It's like hell where they live. And Alice is sweet as hell, but she loves Timothy. I would say if Alice had a husband that was strong, she could do something with her life. Is a kid like Timothy, what happens to a kid like that down the road? He's like a guy on a trip without a road map. Timothy's just out there. Timothy doesn't know which way he wants to go, what he wants to do. Timothy is a guy with great talent. As far as art, the kid could draw anything. But Timothy is a, a ladies' man. Is that a point of pride with him? Accomplishment? To him, I would imagine, yeah, it's an accomplishment. Where does he get any money, Shahid? He doesn't work. He told me he hadn't had a job in two years. Oh, Alice gets her, uh, her uh, assistance, I imagine. Welfare? Yeah, welfare and stuff. And that happened a lot. The mother gets public assistance and helps a guy on the side. Oh, uh, I don't know if you would say they help him, but you know, it's a lot of guys that I know that just goes around looking for welfare mothers, and they may have six of them like that and get a little piece of money out of each of them. That's their job. You know, that's their hustle. What do you think about welfare? Welfare, to me, some people need it. You know, I'll be yeah. for real. Some people really actually need it. And then others take advantage of it. Sandra Alice told me yesterday that she thinks welfare has made her lazy. Yeah, because it's there. You know that your, your food is going to be there every month because with welfare finance come food stamps. Then you get Medicaid to cover your medical expenses. Welfare is doing everything. You're married to welfare, a lot of the women's. They're more married to welfare than the guy is laying in the bed next to him. Because he's just a physical thing. 
the whole backbone of the family is coming out of downtown or out of uptown offices. Government offices? Yeah. Does this cycle of dependency, I mean, what does it do to the values of these kids? Oh, they see it as, as, a, as a game. You know, somebody owes me something. Somebody's going to take care of me. It's not the self-esteem. What do you think's ahead for kids like Timothy? Maybe he'll get shot or he'll pick up a gun to protect himself and he'll get shot by a police officer pulling it or he'll get arrested. Some of these kids are just losers, aren't they? Sad as it I is. I mean, yeah, you, you, you're born into a dead end, you know, and you, you're in that rut. If you're born into that type of situation, how do you escape? That's the biggest question that I would like to answer. So I could start getting these kids to know. Why do they have kids so early? Why do these children have children? This is a dead end. That's a perfect description for it. Well, when, when I was growing, growing up, sex was almost a dirty word. Now sex is what's happening. You know, they see uh, sex in TVs, sex in uh, movies, sex everywhere. You know, and... Uh, some girls think uh, it's cute walking down the street praying. Don't you ever get discouraged? I get discouraged. I lock people up. I get in fights. Don't you ever want to walk away from them? Yes, but I feel like so many people have done that. To me, I'm, I hate to lose. I hate to lose. And I never would have started working with kids if I didn't, you know, for me to walk away from it and feel like I lost. Dr. George Jackson is a practicing psychologist who teaches at Howard University. He is blind. Three days a week, he counsels Newark kids referred to him by the courts and the social workers. Dr. Jackson cannot see, but he has heard over and over what the breakdown of the family means to children. We see depression. We see terrible anger. We see a lack of expectancy. What are they angry about? Children are born uh, without any understanding as to how to manage their feelings and it's through the training and teaching that these foundations are set. Um, children who are the children of children are not being trained to understand how to manage their feelings so they want when they want what they want when they want it and when they don't get it <clears throat> they get angry. I talked to a young man yesterday, 30 now, well, he described what happened to him when he was 15, how he took a baseball bat to somebody who'd messed with his girlfriend, how he actually shot somebody who had spit on him. What causes that hair trigger emotion? If you have no respect for uh, uh, life, you then will try to destroy or dismantle another person. It won't matter to you. Such a person doesn't have a conscience. And um, I think that, uh, again, we don't have the foundations. The foundations weren't set. We've talked to one 27-year-old father. He has seven kids he's not caring for. Seven kids by several different women. Why? Why does that happen? If you're a rolling stone, and if the father before you was a rolling stone, or there are no values to constrain you from this behavior, then you have, uh, you, you do this and you do it with in, in, impunity. It becomes a badge of honor? Right. And it's the only badge of honor that you expect to get. Do they feel any um, sense of guilt over their impotence as fathers? No. Um, not the kind of guilt that would be appropriate to changing the behavior. Are we breeding a new outlaw society? We're breeding a society more that will destroy itself. So well, people say, well, that doesn't bother me. I mean, as long as they stay in Newark and shoot each other and mug each other and screw each other, so what do I care? But what goes around comes around. It may appear that these individuals are on um, reservations, they're isolated, but you cannot really divorce yourself from what happens to other people in this country. And if you design a society, a sub-society where people will annihilate themselves, it won't be long before this becomes a disease that infects the entire population. You don't think we can run to the suburbs anymore? No, I think you can run, but you can't hide. <laughs> All right, who would like people on the field? James Wallace chose not to run or to hide. He learned in his own youth that one person who cares can make a difference. When I came up, I wasn't uh, what you would call an angel. 
I, I did little things. I was a one-parent family. I only had a mother. That's why I can relate to these kids. But there was another old man that took interest in me and showed me the right way. And he said to you, you matter. Yes, yes. He said, uh, you have more to offer than what you're doing. 20 years ago, James Wallace began telling young people they matter. At first, he ran after school programs. Nice house again, nice house. Now he and his wife, Carolyn, head the International Youth Organization, a community center in the heart of Newark. If James Wallace is a surrogate father to many kids, Carolyn Wallace is a surrogate mother. She's seen too many children grow up and stumble not to be angry. If the parent is 17 and 18, uneducated, unmotivated, fooling around, wandering around, what's the child going to learn? Who's to teach him? When you learn something, you was taught by your parents. It was reinforced by school and your neighbors, but it was taught by your parents. Your parents said, Bill, you better not do that. Don't put that plug over there. You're going to get hurt a whipping, right? Your parents did it. Well, if the parents don't know anything, how are they going to teach the children? Now, if we have a generation of that kind of thing happening and the kids are, are coming up under that, then we got another generation of lost young people. Why are there so many single-parent households? Have you been walking the streets in Newark lately? All our young men are out on the corner, just absolutely doing nothing. That's the problem. Well, what's happened to those young men? What's happened to the black man? It's like they've given up. It's like they're really not a part of what's going on. Um, why are they not? Why, why have they given up? There aren't that many jobs, okay, for the laborer like they used to be. Uh, and they're just totally unmotivated. And society has made living for the women without the husband or without the male easy. Oh. Yeah, welfare. I think welfare is not the best thing for everybody. Tell me why. Because it provides you with some kind of income that you sooner or later just settle for. I know I was on welfare. I've been on welfare. Are you suggesting that we do away with welfare? No. I'm saying it has to be upgraded. For instance, I have some young people here that are on welfare, okay, but would like to work. But they can't work and make a coin because everything you make is taken away from your check. Can you push the solution even further back? Is there any way to stop the cycle of teenage pregnancies? That's so difficult to even talk about. In my heart, I think I, I have a solution. And I know now it may rub people the wrong way. But I believe that teenage pregnancy cannot be stopped by programs. It has to be morals. And morals come from God. And somewhere along the line, the black family kind of strayed away from that. And I believe we need it. You say the moral values have changed. Oh, yes. It's morally acceptable to have babies. It was not morally acceptable years ago. That's hurting the black family. He's what I hear strong. you saying is that even though racism may have brought about these circumstances, even though society may have created conditions that, that are terrible, you're saying you have to be responsible. You have to practice discipline and self-restraint. That's right. We are destroying ourselves. Now, it might have been motivated and, and plotted and seeded with racism, but we, we're content to be in this well now, okay? We're just content to be in this mud, and we need to get out of it. Uh, there aren't any great white people running around in this block tearing up stuff. It's us. We've got to stop doing that. Does the civil rights movement, which came to its peak in the 60s, have anything to say to this? The civil rights to the young people now is a foreign word. What does it really mean to them? They don't have any knowledge about it. The I issue now is different, isn't it? Yes, it is. I'm quite sure it is. Uh, if Martin Luther King were alive, he would not be talking about uh, the things I think he was talking about, labor and all that. I think he'd be talking about the black family. And you're worried about the survival of the black family. You think it's precarious? I think it's, in, it's all going to be an endangered species. <laughs> Even though the messages that kids are getting from society seems to say, do anything you want to, the United States government, government of New Jersey, a white man like Moyers cannot step in and say to young black kids, it's not right to have children out of wedlock, welfare needs to be changed, you've got to take responsibility. Who's going to say these things to these kids? Why can't you say it? They won't listen to me. Doesn't make any difference. You've got to say it anyway. They may not listen to me either. But I'm saying if you say it in your corner and I say it in my corner and everybody is saying it, it's going to be like a drumbeat, and sooner or later it will sound.
but it, it's not just for me to talk about. It's for all of us to talk about. And, it, and I think it's going to surpass colors. And you're not going to be safe. I'm not going to be safe. And nobody's going to be safe unless we all send out this drumbeat. Hey, let's deal with it. Let's deal with the problem. All the people got guns and turn stick up kids while the mother is at home shed in tears because the son that she thought she had brought up right is on In just a moment, four distinguished black leaders will discuss the documentary you have just seen and the issues it raises. Stay tuned for the continuation of Crisis in Black America. He think life is all about on the streets being a two-time loser and a petty thief, but everybody know that you're the people are weak because you're no good for nothing. This way you're good for something. Oh boy, the only thing you're good for is fighting. So far we've listened this evening to the people who are actually living the experience that was the subject of this broadcast. Now we want to hear from some people who come at the issue from different angles. With me are the Reverend Jesse Jackson, Charles Knox, who was born and reared in Newark and is now director of police there. He introduced me to Shahid Jackson, whom Director Knox personally assigned to the police athletic program in Newark. Eleanor Holmes Norton, who once chaired the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and is now professor of law at Georgetown University. And Dr. Glenn Lowry, professor of political economy at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard and a member of the Council for a Black Economic Agenda. Dr. Lowry, as you listen to those voices, what went through your mind? Well, I was deeply moved. I was impressed with what I perceived to be the great strengths of character in some of the individuals. I was dismayed at what I perceive as the profundity of the problem that confronts us. Um, I was encouraged by some of what I heard said, particularly the emphasis on values, um, the strength and the helping hand that I saw coming from some people indigenous to that community made me hopeful about the possibilities that we can, even at this late date, still make a significant dent in the problem. But. Realistically, I was also chastened by the sense of the fact that we've got an awfully long way to go. It'll be decades before we can actually turn the circumstance around. What do you think, each of you, what do you think can be done to break the cycle of children born of children born of children? The third generation, as you saw in the film, of teenage mothers in one family. What can be done practically, specifically? This is not like any other social problem that has ever arisen in this country. This is not like unemployment. This is not like uh, teenage uh, uh, delinquency. This is not even like children who can't read. This is a conundrum. This is a com. Well, I'm, I'm, I, I want to. I want to get to it. I, I want to describe the beast before I try to try to get to the remedy. Uh, what when you have a phenomenon as complex as to have cut to the very heart of the most basic institution in society, the family, you have got a real problem on your hands. There's no question that the mobilization, internal mobilization of the black community, as if their life depended on it, because it does, right. is the first priority. But we've got to understand as well what the context is. The social and moral context goes against what is happening in the United States today. Sex and crime and uh, undisciplined forces surround the black community, do not, do not emanate from it. Comes in through the tube every night. Comes in through the tube, comes in, is, is piped in in a thousand different ways. So, so that the black community is going against the, against the grain, but go against the grain, grain it must. It's got to do that itself, but again, in order to avoid the, the, the cynical uh, connotation that this can be done, in a self-made fashion without, for example, the jobs for the teenage boys to go to is to create the possibility of an, e of an even worse situation. One thing I think uh, we, we who prescribe uh, remedies forget, and that is that virtually none of us are truly self-made people. Somewhere you can find something that made, made a difference. When you say to a boy that's 15, the, the last boy, for example, we don't know which way he's going, if that boy is born of, let us say, a functionally illiterate mother, 
uh, grows up uh, surrounded by a pathological environment and we say, hey, go out there and make something of yourself, we are in effect saying, recreate yourself in a way that nobody I personally know know has done. This At is the very not a, least, society has some responsibility. This here. is not an easy society in which to pull oneself up by one's bootstraps. Not any longer. No, it's not. My point is, on this issue of sex education and sex discipline and self-respect, uh, there must be a massive countercultural movement by no less than the people who have the ears of the masses of our young people. The first generation by age 15 has watched 18,000 hours of television, about 700,000 murders, 20 odd thousand hours of radio, less than 11,000 hours of school, and less than 3,000 hours of church. So who has the, the maximum access to our children's minds? Mass media has more access and makes a greater impression than home, church, and school combined. That's a kind of centralization of our society where very central messages are being fed in saying that babies making babies. And the idea of a girl thinking that, that, that being pregnant is a beautiful profile as a sense of, of being, uh, of looking all right, that says that the decadence has hit a point where we must in mass join hands and stop finger pointing and go another way. We well, it's started. not only that, it's, it's the music, you know, even our music. Every uh, every song you hear, there's no 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 real message except more sex, uh, uh, more uh, uh, lowering of your values and morals. You, know, you can't even hear a good song. The song has a good beat, but you listen to the words. The words are outrageous. Director Knox, you heard in the beginning of the broadcast uh, some of the young women say male figures are not essential. Uh, they don't think their children need a father. Did that ring true to you on the basis of your experience with these kids? I think that uh, a family means a husband and a wife. Yeah. So I'm very, very uh, um, perplexed, you know, to hear females say that they don't believe that they can, that they need to have a man around. I think people say what they have to say. These women don't have any prospect of marriage, and so they have rationalized their lives uh, the way they see them. They, we saw women who are surrounded by other women in the prior generation who also had no husbands. And this has become, therefore, uh, intergenerational uh, and expectable. And thus they say what indeed turns out to be, at least for them, quite realistic. That's one concern. Secondly, there are some areas in there of moral degeneracy. The young man with all of the, uh, the babies without any sense of responsibility that is that is moral degeneracy and it's not genetic it's environmental and therefore we have some obligation to speak of the need for moral regeneration the danger is that in the process of giving this problem which i think is a discrete and identifiable problem uh, too much attention we will stigmatize the individuals involved and we will adversely affect the way in which uh, the rest of the american society perceives this problem the danger is well founded because there are people in this society uh, who would make use of these kinds of images in order to legitimize certain mean-spirited policy uh, inclinations that they have uh, and not deal seriously with the problem but what i want to say is that there is a discrete identifiable inner city uh, context such as that described in Newark which is repeated in many many other communities around the country and which is in some ways different from not better or worse but different in its particulars from the situation of uh, West Virginia or of rural Arkansas or whatever uh, we could see in this film the importance of peers the importance of what might be called the local culture the, the values and the interactions between people that were happening in that particular context you know Bill the reason I I keep trying to keep this issue broader than just a black situation. A, for the reason that Dr. Lyra said it. I remember once speaking in a Washington, D.C. school about the impact of drugs and liquor and babies making babies and violence. And I challenge the youth in that environment to make a choice, as it were, the youth to choose hope over dope and to give life a chance. And those who could really hear me with their inner ear to come forward. 600, about 300 came forward having experimented with some form of drugs. And it was traumatic to see that many boys and girls come forward. And so next day I went to Montgomery County and then went to the Latin school just outside of uh, Harvard there in Boston. And when white children came forward in even greater numbers, it shifted from they got a problem to we got a problem. I said in the beginning of the program that 
white families are in trouble too. The single parent family is twice as common in the country as it was 20 years ago. But in the 1960s, when this issue of what was happening, the breakdown of the black family in particular was raised, we all retreated from it. And as a consequence of that, blacks in meetings that I've attended and read about and listened to are debating the issue within the black community. And the facts are there. They come from the Census Bureau. They come from, uh, uh, from the Children's Defense Fund that the rate of birth to black teens is twice that for whites. Women had 50% of all black families with children under 18 compared to 15% for white children. Only 41% of black children are living with both parents compared to 80% of white children and 70% of Hispanic children. So while it is true that, that white families are in trouble, that blacks are not the only ones who have children out of wedlock, the reality says that it, it's pronounced, it's exaggerated, it's concentrated in many respects it, among black families. Are you willing to admit that? Are we I'm, I'm not only willing to admit it, I think we've got to sound the alarm about it. And I think increasingly that alarm is being sounded from within the black community, and that is the important change I think that has occurred. Uh, the, there, there is no question that this is a phenomenon that stretches across the face of the United States, and I couldn't agree with Jesse Moore, that we have to deal with it in its national context. At the same time, uh, I think it is clear that it has reached crisis proportions in our community when half of all the children are being born to single women who are disproportionately poor, we see the face of the next generation of black people. And if we keep this up, if we don't find a way to intervene, and it is so complex that intervention has got to take place on, on a number of levels, but if we do not find a way to intervene, we are going to see progressively greater disadvantage with each generation of black people, which is the antithesis of the American imperative. There is a study at the University of Chicago that says if action is not taken, the year 2000 will, the year 2000, 14 years from now, will see 70% of all black families headed by single women and only 30% of black men employed. Now that's the future you're talking about. And you know, in, in some sense, when we had uh, the lack of government support mechanisms uh, in, in days gone by, the only bulwark we had really was a sense of moral resistance, a, a sense of, uh, of discipline, a, a sense of hope against hopelessness. What's happened to that? Well, in, in, in some sense, that, that hope has, uh, has, many of the grapes have been turned into raisins, and a lot of despair has set in. And I remember some years ago, about 1976, you might recall, the, uh, Attorney Norton and I began to talk about in our schools about the we, um, opportunity was about to out distance effort and that a formula of effort to the third power plus opportunity represented a breakthrough and somehow we must keep this this balance between effort and opportunity and one sense is in this film an awful lot of a lot of despair and in our analysis of it we must not give the impression that we're defending it are trying to justify it because it, it really is unjustifiable. Uh, I go to schools, Bill, and I'll ask four to five thousand children, white, black, and brown, how many of you know someone who is in uh, who is dead because of drugs? Almost every hand will go up. How many know someone who is in jail because of drugs? Every hand goes up in your generation. How many know someone at this school who has taken drugs? Hands up. How many know someone who has brought a gun or a knife to school? And I'll tell you whether it is the suburbs of, of Montgomery County, or San Diego, or Newark, or Boston. It is a pervasive threat to this generation of young people. And the most fundamental question when I ask them, do you believe taking drugs and babies having babies is morally wrong? There's a split opinion. There's no, uh, there's no absolute ethic of moral resistance. Mrs. Wallace to, said that. To taking drugs or the baby. Then I said, well, do you think that taking uh, uh, drugs will kill you? Well, we're not sure. Uh, you can afford a baby. Not sure. So there is neither the moral nor the mental resistance at this point to the drug alcohol phenomenon or the babies making babies. Now let's take 
three specific issues that were raised by the film, and we'll start with welfare. Charles Murray, uh, in his book, Losing Ground, called for scrapping the entire federal welfare and income support structure for people who, who can work. AF, ADFC, Medicaid, food stamps, subsidized housing, and so on. He says, this would leave the working age person with no recourse whatsoever except the job market, family members, friends, and public or private locally funded sources. Do away with it altogether force people to look for help from their peers and from whatever sources are nearby. And you saw in the film that uh, one woman, one mother said, welfare makes me lazy. You heard Shaheed Jackson, your uh, compatriot, to say that it's become uh, a way of life for many men over there. What do you think about welfare as a specific uh, factor in this problem, Director Knox? Well, I, uh, I don't think we should do away with it. I think some people need it. Uh, I, I don't think that we should allow it to be a self-perpetuating uh, uh, institution, though. Uh, what, uh, what happens is there's no steps taken to, uh, to provide any incentive for people to get off of it. Uh, the result is uh, you, you end up with people who are hopeless, who feel that uh, that's the easy way out. And, uh, and, and particularly in my profession, it creates a real problem for me. How come? Because I find that, that, that some of the kids that you saw in those films, uh, guys like the slick one who walks around and he makes all these babies and he has uh, no sense of responsibility, there's the same stick-up guy that I have to arrest every day. See, uh, Not only is the impact on me, but he impacts on everyone else in our community. Uh, and the result is that uh, we don't have any place to put these guys, and I'm a firm believer that some of them, some of them are in, unsalvageable. You know, as much They're as I lost, feel, like Shahid said, that's right. Lost. As much as I feel uh, 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 compassion, you know, for 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 trying to salvage kids that that can be salvaged, you know, by providing another alternative for them, except for this crime and stuff, I believe that some of them are unsalvageable. You put and your, I based that on 21 years of police experience. You put your your pencil down on the table when he said that. Were you uh, disagreeing or agreeing with him? Are we going to have to give up on some of these and try for the next generation? Well, I, I hate to say we have to give up, but I agree that we are sometimes confronted with individuals whose behavior compels of us as a pragmatic and moral matter that they be dealt with uh, accordingly. And people who are violently brutalizing their primarily black neighbors in the central cities of these countries, of this country, it seems to me, warrant that kind of response. We'll come back on that point in just one minute after this message.